Hello and welcome to News Click. The use of social media has become quite a craze in India. With millions of people using Facebook, Twitter and other such services, we've seen an explosion of user-driven content, online debate and discussion. However, there is a dark side to how social media services are being used, which is often ignored. In the Indian context, it's a depressingly familiar story. A person posts a fairly innocuous comment that contains views unpalatable to a few and the person is promptly barracked and abused, often till the person quits using the internet. It's bad enough if the user is a male, but if female, the level of hate spewed against them is often of a completely different level, ranging from sexual innuendo to death threats and threats of rape. To discuss the issue, we have with us Neha Dixit, a freelance journalist, and Apar Gupta, a technology lawyer. Thank you both for being with us today. Now, Neha, I'd like to start with you. Do you think it's fair to say that women in particular are easy targets for online trolling? I mean, and there always seems to be a sexual angle to the trolling that uh, women uh, bear the brunt of. I mean, ranging from name calling to, you know, public shaming to threats of rape. Uh, would you think that this is just a reflection of our society or is it something specific to the internet, possibly because of heightened sense of anonymity, maybe? I agree with you when you say that it's a reflection in the society because anyway, in everyday language, misogyny is so deeply entrenched, the kind of language we use. And then women who are posting stuff online face this because they come across as more assertive and the very strategy to pull them down is by using this language. And as you say, it is definitely anonymity that plays into this whole situation because a lot of trolls, if you notice the handles on Twitter or otherwise as well, people who come and post on your blogs, there is actually not a specific name that they have and it's actually an in handles that they use to uh, abuse women and there have been several cases in the last uh, of uh, five months in particular where uh, the moment uh, the activists, journalists, writers, the moment they are talking about anything that is uh, largely opposed to the majority online, mm -hmm. They, they get attacked with these kind of uh, abuses. There are rape threats all the time. The violence is so deeply entrenched in the way uh, one is addressed and it is always moved away from the topic of discussion. And it does definitely come from the fact that it is a extremely patriarchal setup even on, on, on the internet and the mis misogyny is deeply uh, rooted. So let me actually take that to Apar. I mean, so while the sort of abuse we've seen in a lot of cases in the recent past have clearly been, I mean, over the top, often the police have failed to actually deal with these incidents in, in any proactive manner. I mean, so why is this the case? Are our legal provisions insufficient? There's no getting away from the systematic faults which are uh, visible in India in as much that there are no police reforms, there's no police funding, police work two to three days at a stretch, and they're incentivized not to register FIRs, on the contrary, to show that there has been a progressive decrease in crime through proactive policing. So would you actually think that that's an area that we really need to concentrate on, given also that India is planning to go ahead with, you know, having smart C cities, a digital certainly. India plan, so on and so forth? Certainly. Uh, I would think that uh, the best way possible is to actually investigate offences without doubting the testimony of a victim, registering an FIR. However, at the same point of time, substantive provisions should not have uh, disproportionate penalties in a sense which can then be used against activists itself. For instance, there are documented cases where under the indecent representation of Women's Act, mm -hmm. women's activists themselves have been charged with non-bailable offences for putting up posters uh, with respect to, for instance, breast cancer. Right because they are depicting a woman in a state of undress. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, legal solutions which are recognizable have to go beyond mere substantive additions mm -hmm. to the Information Technology Act in which we create new category of offenses which have punishments for 7 to 10 years. Let's look at systematic faults, concentrate on police, concentrate on courts, give them more money, funding and set up better so infrastructure. what you seem to be saying is broadly the legal system is in place but the way it's enforced so on and so forth is not ideal. The if way you look at it, uh, substantive offences uh, exist even for uh, using abusive language which contemplate an imprisonment of three years. For instance, every time an abuse is slung across the internet, 
investigation is not the problem, registering FIR is not the problem, it's the conviction. Take for instance a provision on which all of us will agree, which is outraging the modesty of a woman by using insulting words. However, going beyond that, rape threats etc. can be directly prosecuted under it. Why aren't prosecutions ending in convictions within a period of one to two years? Just yes, to sir. add to that point, like Apar said, that there is a law in place. But uh, since May 16, the kind of cases that have come up, for mm -hmm. instance, students are getting arrested for critiquing Modi or the BJP or the mm -hmm. pre present government. So one, uh, when one is discussing these things, this also has to be taken into account that if such a law is in place, it to what effect is it uh, right. getting implemented? Sure. Now, it's often argued that if you have an online presence at all, I mean, you're opening up yourself for abuse and you just have to learn to deal with it or you ignore it. Um, so how do you differentiate though between harmless banter and aggressive trolling? I mean, where do you draw that line normally? I mean, in your personal instance. If I say the last four articles that I've written, and they had something to do with the minorities, with Muslims, with uh, the present government, Modi, and had, uh, for instance, one of this article that I had written for Foreign Policy magazine, which was about defamation cases. And the moment they come up, one was waking up with three, four hundred emails every single day and with all kinds of uh, with rape threats uh, with uh, and my in fact my blog was reported and I couldn't access my blog for a good two, two and a half days and each time one would open Twitter because the trolls are organized and especially I would not mince my words in saying that the right wing is really uh, organized that way because there are certain handles that you can identify who do this every single day from 8 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock in the night and they have they follow each other so the moment somebody starts criticizing an article on a write-up or a statement suddenly there, there'll be 20,000 people in in one single hour writing things to you so one should say that it just starts at that level starts at the level of rape threats and abusive language so you know and one started reporting for instance in this particular case when I had written this article on defamation one started reporting certain handles but how many handles can you block in a single day it was happening with some other writers and activists as well and then we so now we have formed an informal group so the moment somebody is sending rape threats uh, to somebody in this group we start reporting it and we've managed to uh, get several accounts deactivated. Apar, I've often felt that in India, I mean, law enforcement agencies, institutions uh, prefer to take the easy way out. I mean, by clamping down on any unorthodox statements or statements which could possibly in any way offend the majority sentiment. So do you think courts are actually being sufficiently careful to protect the freedom of speech when it comes to religion and other such issues. Rishabh, if you look at it, 295A and other provisions in the Indian Penal Code were originally uh, made at the time when there were communal disturbances happening in which the legislature felt that there should be provisions which, uh, which take, took into account that India as a multicultural and secular country with uh, large populations of uh, different communities pocketed mm -hmm. uh, uh, should stay in peace and harmony. This of course uh, arises from a painful history of partition. Yeah. Now if you look at it in modern practice, the way these provisions have been used, uh, they are being used more often than not against uh, people uh, who voice dissent. For instance, if you look at the recent instances in Kerala, yeah. uh, um, uh, college students have been uh, uh, charged with it for creating a crossword quiz mm -hmm. right but then again we go back to it how does police register FIRs police is always reluctant to register FIRs because not only does it show increase in incidence of crime but they have only two recourses after they register FIR it is either to investigate and submit a charge sheet to court or secondly to file a closure for the absence of evidence if it does the second it can be challenged by the complainant in court thereby bringing them into mm -hmm. scrutiny by the court itself as to why they did not register the FIR. What we are not having today is honest discussions which are forcing our government rather than making criminal law amendment acts to make police reform amendment acts as well as setting up additional courts funding these two arms of government which are essential to maintain law and order. Neha, I mean, given also of course what you just mentioned about how, um, you know, we've, we've got the right wing fringe in particular which seems to have emerged from the shadows particularly after the new government has come into 
power. I mean, so do you have comments on this, on the use of religion? It is very apparent that the moment uh, there are words like Muslim or uh, Modi or BJP, the moment there is, there's an article up there on Twitter, you see this entire army coming and uh, start attacking the person who has posted it. I mean, we now have situations where almost every political party has a social media wing with armies of paid yeah. Or volunteers yes, you know, yeah. who are out to troll people, I Correct. understand. And then it just increases. And there is no, there is absolutely uh, there's strong evidence to believe that they are actually paid and organized because that they do it 24-7. The moment one person uh, goes off, the other person start, uh, takes mm -hmm. over from the, that very point. So, also I, I would like to mention that because they have such a huge presence online, the social, on social media. Mm -hmm. so. Then when we say we report abuse, like for, for instance, my account was reported because I was tweeting this and because there were so many people who were opposed to what I was writing. And so one has to see, look at it with that perspective as well. You know that, okay, people are reporting abuse, but if, if suddenly 20,000 people are reporting my account uh, for uh, indecent stuff, mm -hmm. then then what happens? So then how are we going to take it forward? So that is also an important question. And since the new government has taken over, uh, it is unfortunate that this has really increased and the there is no space for dissent any longer. So do you think intermediaries generally, or so that social media providers or service providers, should they actually have a role in filtering content? Um, you know, should Twitter and Facebook actually be in charge of what's happening on their sites? Or is it the police and the judicial authorities um, that you think actually should play the first role? Here, I think it's, 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 a, it's a very tricky question because uh, then the moment you say that somebody is designated to see what is, what is going online, then you are actually even giving the power to that person to decide exactly. and makes that kind of editorial intervention whether this should be there yeah. or this shouldn't be there. So I think at that level it's very uh, tricky. But uh, like on a local level, I would say by example, whatever I've been using and I know other people, there are app, apps like Black Dot, which are, we've been using to filter this kind of uh, content. Uh, each time somebody is writing some stuff to me, I have, I'm using that app and it gets, fils filter, it gets filtered. And it's according to uh, my needs and what I want to be filtered. But on a larger level, I don't. I, I think it's very tricky because then it it can just sway in any direction. Fair enough. Upar, where do you stand on this sort of balance between free speech versus rights I, versus the internet by itself is a huge um, uh, tool for democratizing uh, voices, which never had it, and it allows people who have not traditionally had the power of publication mm -hmm. to actually go ahead and publish. For instance, you have menstrupedia.com, where women freely discuss myths with regard to menstru menstruation. Now, uh, what is the role of the platform in that? They will, of course, need to create some platform which does allow them to exchange these views. Sure. Good alternative right now is to work with these private corporations, at the same time work with our governments to allow them the space to post these things. For instance, all of these cases in which uh, FIs are registered, ultimately the intermediary is also more often than not made a party to the case, made a witness to the case and it's added expense on them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So if your substantive laws are in line with um, uh, good freedom of speech principles, mm -hmm. then you won't have these issues to begin with. We've, we've had reports on how in um, the recent violence in Ferguson in the US, uh, sites such as Facebook and Twitter have, because of the way their algorithms are structured, not been carrying news from those particular events. So clearly there is some sort of filter bubble already created in these websites. So can you actually have technical measures that would weed out certain types of abuse, not just rely on uh, a person my, reporting? My it? only problem with that would be that then it will always be overbroad. When you rely on technology to censor, leave aside a human being to censor. A human being has political preferences. Technology is dumb. So, if you're trusting technology to filter, censor, it will not be intelligent. It will be dumb. It, it will block off a lot of uh, forms of art, for instance. So, what separates a video which is glorifying rape from one, which is throwing it into question, is uh, sometimes we as human beings ourselves cannot decide. We have long-ranging debates on Twitter that whether this depiction of rape was sensitive or was not, yeah. right? How can we trust technology to do that? Now, uh, last question. Um, 
we've always had this issue of whether we will be able to enforce our laws in this space, given, of course, that a lot of these companies are foreign companies and they have taken pleas in court saying that they are not necessarily bound by the laws of India since they're registered in the US and they have different uh, freedom of speech laws. So where, how do you think this will actually play out? Will we actually be able to enforce our laws effectively in the online space? I, I think so. The problem of enforcement is not as great as it's made out to be. It's a Trojan argument used by the government of India to force data localization in which these companies have to register or to have servers in India. It also has another end to it in which uh, they want to monitor intercept communications. Mm -hmm. That's another topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, But let me tell you broadly, having studied the interception regime in India, it is not transparent, there are no checks and balances, and it's done as per uh, executive, executive checks, fiat. Essentially, yes, yeah. yes. Secondly, I think most of the perpetrators of this abuse, the specific instance which we are talking about, are based in India. Right. You do have uh, the token NRIs mm -hmm. who sitting abroad engage in abuse, but I think it's directed in India by itself. Moreover, there are legal tools which exist, for instance, letters uh, uh, rogatory, uh, which can be enforced after our local courts uh, issue um, orders mm -hmm. for their extradition, etc. It can be done. Uh, but yeah, it's not as uh, easy as, for instance, arresting somebody. Um, who is uh, locally within the jurisdiction right. of a state. Thank you both for joining us yeah. today. I mean, that's all the time we have today on News Click. And do join us again later.